buongiorno, benvenuto. Welcome to the very last episode of City Breaks Florence, episode 19, which is going to be on literary Florence. I'm going to choose a number of writers, some Italian, some English or American, who are connected with the city, tell you a little bit about what they wrote and read some extracts. In previous episodes, I've already covered two medieval Italian writers, Dante and Machiavelli, so won't be going back over them, but I would like to mention two other medieval writers who were both Tuscan-based, and that's Petrarch and Boccaccio. They were born in the early 14th century, only seven years apart. They were great friends, in fact, and they are both writers who are read today, certainly in Italy, and also quite often in English translation as well. So, to start with Petrarch, or Francesco Petrarca, as he's called in Italian, he was born in 1304 in Arezzo, and he spent most of his childhood in or near Florence. When he was a young man, he went off to study law, but he didn't get very far with that because he then decided to change to classics. I think he was already drawn to words and language and literature. And then when he finished his studies, he joined an ecclesiastical order. He was serving a cardinal, one Cardinal Colonna, and this allowed him to travel, and that was the period when he really began to start writing. He also did a lot of reading. He was very interested in Latin literature, read a lot of poetry, and used to discuss what he'd read and what he was writing with his friend Boccaccio, who we'll come to in a minute. Perhaps the most significant event in Petrarch's young life happened in 1327, when he was 23. He went to Mass in Avignon, where he was living and working, and saw, this is going to sound familiar from the Dante story, saw a young lady with whom he fell absolutely, madly, totally, completely in love. Her name was Laura, Laura in English. It's believed that her full name was Laura de Noves, and I'm afraid that textbooks talk about his unrequited passion for her. So it doesn't sound as if it had a happy ending, but he did dedicate much of the poetry that he wrote for the rest of his life to her. Not least in a collection of sonnets called, wait for the Italian title, Rime in Vita e Morte di Madonna Laura, which I think means poetry on the life and death of Lady Laura. You could find them in an English bookshop filed under Petrarch's sonnets, and There were 365 of these sonnets because he particularly wanted to write one passionate poem for every day of the year dedicated to Laura. Just to give you a flavour, I'm going to read out four lines from one of the 365 sonnets. Remember, of course, that in the English translation, the rhyme has got lost. But nevertheless, it's rather lovely. He's remembering the moment when he first saw Laura and how he felt at the time. So this is what he writes. I bless the place, the time and hour of the day that my eyes aimed their sights at such a height and say, my soul, you must be very grateful that you were found worthy of such great honour. The other thing that Petrarch is known to us today for is his pithy little sayings. So, for example, how about this one? Rarely do great beauty and great virtue dwell together. Try putting that in the context of, oh, I don't know, modern celebrities perhaps? And then he's very wise on the five great enemies of peace, which he says inhabit within us. And they are, quote, avarice, ambition, envy, anger, and pride. And he tells us that if we could get rid of all those feelings, we should infallibly enjoy perpetual peace. Living and working alongside Petrarch for much of the time was Giovanni Boccaccio, born in 1313. The two of them are remembered really as having laid the foundations of Italian literature because they actually wrote in the Tuscan dialect which became the Italian language and made people see that literature written in the Italy of the day could be just as good as the classics that everybody was reading at the time in Latin. He's best known for a book called Decameron which is billed as a collection of earthy tales and which, in fact, are very much on the same lines as the Canterbury Tales, because the premise is that there are ten young people, seven women, three men, fleeing from Florence. Florence is plague-struck at the time. This is set in 1348, and so they decide to leave. And they walk off into the countryside, where they hope they'll be safer, and the journey takes ten days, and on each day, each of the ten people tells a story. So there's going to be a collection of a hundred tales in all and a real mix of subject matter. 
Some of the stories are tragic, some of them are comic. There are the themes you might expect from courtly literature, things like chivalry and love, but also a lot of material rooted in things that Boccaccio had observed by watching other people and listening to how they spoke. You may recall I read an extract from the opening of the book in which Boccaccio describes the plague. He's giving the reason why the ten people decided to flee the city. You might remember the graphic descriptions of the symptoms. Just a tiny quote to jog your memory. Um, He wrote about tumours appearing, quote, in the groin or under the armpits, some as big as a small apple, others as an egg, and then went on to describe the purple spots which followed and the likely conclusion, which was death in most cases. That's a much read passage because, of course, it tells historians so much about the effect of the plague. But he wrote lots of other things as well. So just a tiny quote from another story, which is about a physician of extraordinary note, as he's called, a man called Master Albert, who we are told was living in Bologna. He's nearly 70 years old. Boccaccio obviously thought this was completely ancient. And despite this advanced age, this poor man has fallen madly in love. He's seen at an entertainment, as we're told. He's been out somewhere and seen a most beautiful lady, a widow. We're given her name, Margarida de Ghisolieri, and we're told that this poor physician was, quote, no less smitten than if he had been a younger person, nor could he rest at nights unless he had seen the fair one by day. And he goes on to describe this man riding past her house on horseback or on foot every day, backwards and forwards, just hoping that he's going to see her. And then a bit of village gossip. It wasn't long before she and, quote, some other ladies of her acquaintance noticed what was happening and thought it was funny. As Boccaccio puts it himself, they, quote, would often make themselves merry to see a person of his years and learning so ridiculously amorous. I'm afraid I only have an extract in front of me, so I can't tell you what happens in the end. Let's hope it worked out well for him. So, I'm going to leap forward to the 19th century now and think about the two poets Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who lived and wrote in Florence. One of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's well-known pieces of work is something called Casa Guidi Windows. Casa Guidi was the house opposite the Pitti Palace where they lived. It's a two-part work about the turbulent history of 1848, when the politics of the day seemed to be moving towards more freedom for the citizens. Grand Duke Leopold restored civil liberties to Florentines in that year. And there's a joyful first half about that. And then there's a second half written after the collapse of the venture, which describes the Austrian army marching into Florence in 1849. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was a great supporter of Italian liberation. She wanted the unification to happen. And the first half of the poem particularly has many references to Italian history and famous Italians from the past, Dante, Michelangelo and so on. She's telling us some of the many things she loves about Italy, and that explains why, in the second half of the poem, she's horrified to see foreign troops marching in. But the poem ends in a spirit of hope. She talks, for example, about, quote, this great cause of southern men who strive in God's name for man's rights and shall not fail. In Italy, it's for this poem and for her support for the Risorgimento, so the unification of Italy, that she's most remembered and for which Florentines were grateful. They said as much by placing a plaque above the door of the Casa Guidi where she lived in 1861, which was a tribute to her for, quote, making with her verse a golden ring binding Italy to England. In England itself, however, I think she's better remembered for her love poems. And I'm going to read you the first few lines of perhaps the most famous one, which she wrote actually while she lived in Florence. It starts like this. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. Elizabeth Barrett Browning died in Florence, and she was buried there. You can visit her tomb today in the English garden in the north of the city. Her husband, Robert Browning, was perhaps the better-known poet of the two. He also wrote much of his work while living in Florence, And just as a flavour, I'm going to quote a couple of extracts from a poem which is very Florentine in atmosphere. It's called Fra Lippo Lippi. It's a dramatic monologue, quite a racy story. It starts with the seizure of Fra Lippo by the city guards. He's wandering in a dodgy part of town late at night. 
And then it goes on to recount his character and some of the things that he got up to. It's a very realistic warts and all sort of portrait. Here are the opening lines. Quote, I am poor brother Lippo, by your leave. You need not clap your torches to my face. Zooks, what's to blame? You think you see a monk? What? Tis past midnight, and you go the rounds, and here you catch me at an alley's end, where sportive ladies leave their doors ajar. Well, that's an arresting opening, is it not? I wonder what happened next. And then, secondly, here are a few lines from later on in the poem, which gives a little picture of the painter's life. It's springtime, it's carnival time, the nights are getting a bit longer. People want to go out and roam the town, and the artist is explaining why that's going to make a lovely change for him. Here's what is written. Quote, and I've been three weeks shut within my mew, a painting for the great man. Saints and saints and saints again. I could not paint all night. Oof, I leaned out of window for fresh air. So just in those few lines, you've got a picture of all that art and painting. The frescoes of saints being created, the great men who were behind the scenes paying for it all. And the poor painter who sometimes needed to get out and get a bit of fresh air. OK then, I'd like to move now to four novels, all of which are set in Florence and from each of which you can learn a lot about the city and the atmosphere and just get a Florentine flavour in general. And the first one is The Agony and the Ecstasy, written by Irving Stone in 1961. It's a 750-page whopper, but don't let that put you off, because it's a really great read. A biographical novel about Michelangelo, starting with his early life, very good on the things that made him attracted to painting and art and how he turned himself into one of the world's best artists and going on chapter by chapter through the rest of his life. Only about half of it is set in Florence because of course he spent a lot of time in Rome but nevertheless I do think it's an excellent read. The very first chapter is called The Studio and it's a description of how Michelangelo came to be taken on in the sculpture school that, that Lorenzo de' Medici had set up. And here's a little description from that first chapter, in which Michelangelo is visiting a church, he's gone to Santa Maria Novella, in fact, and describing how he was very taken by the wonderful artwork that he saw, even at this young age, I think he's about nine or ten at the time. So, quote, Across the nave to the left, he saw a Brunelleschi crucifix, the Strozzi family chapel with frescoes and sculptures by the Orcagna brothers, the front of the major altar with its Ghiberti bronzes, and then, as the epitome of all this magnificence, the Rucellai Chapel, built by his own mother's family in the middle of the 13th century, when they had come into their fortune through a member of the family who had discovered in the Orient how to produce a beautiful red dye. The second chapter is called The Sculpture Garden, and that shows Michelangelo getting better and being noticed, and in fact he thinks he's going to get a commission to do a statue for Lorenzo de' Medici, and here he is one night when he wakes up because he can't stop thinking about the marble that he wants to use. Quote, he leapt out of bed, hurtled into his clothes in the moonlight, bent on reaching Settignano by dawn and spending the day cutting Pietra Serena blocks and columns. Into his mind there flashed the picture of himself working with the Scalpellini at the rear of the garden where all the stones were stored. He saw one in particular, a modest-sized piece of white marble, lying in the grass, a short distance from the building blocks. It came to his mind that this block was exactly the right size for the piece of sculpture he envisioned, a fawn like the one in Lorenzo's studiolo, but his own. There are imagined descriptions of his conversations with Lorenzo when Lorenzo asks him to make him a statue. We see him joining the study group at the Medici Palace, where all the talk was of humanism and philosophy. And there are graphic descriptions of him sneaking into mortuaries at night so that he can draw the dead bodies and become familiar with human anatomy. And there are lots of links to historical moments. So, for example, there's a description of after the death of Savonarola. A lot of artists had left the city, of course, when he was there because there was no need for them. And they began to come back after his death, and the whole business of art and creativity in Florence gradually got going again. So here's a description of Michelangelo at this moment. Quote, Walking through the Piazza della Signoria, the people bowed their heads in shame when they passed the spot where Savonarola's body had been burned. At the same time, 
They were smothering their consciences under a tornado of activity, trying to replace what Savonarola had destroyed, spending large sums with the gold and silversmiths, the gem cutters, the costume makers, the embroiderers, designers of terracotta and wood mosaics, and makers of musical instruments, the manuscript illustrators. And the author describes artists coming back from all over Italy, Milan and Venice, and further afield in Europe, from Portugal, from Paris. And you really get the feeling that the art of the city is going to have new life breathed into it. A bit later on, there's a description of how Michelangelo has finally finished the statue of David that he's been working on pretty much in secret for so long. And there's a very authentic reading account of the 40 workmen moving the statue from the workshop where Michelangelo had created it to the Piazza della Signoria where it was decided to put it. This all took a number of days so that every night the statue would be left and guarded and in the morning they would find that people had left notes on it which said things like We are proud to be Florentines and You have made a thing of beauty. Bravo! In the very last chapter it's told how Michelangelo who by this stage was living in Rome was having a conversation with people on the lines that when he died which he didn't think was going to be very long he wanted his body taken back to Florence so he could be buried in Santa Croce. And the person he's talking to replies like this, quote, The Pope will forbid it, but Florentine merchants can smuggle you out of the Porta del Popolo in a caravan of goods. And that, in fact, is exactly what happened. So you really feel that you're right there in Florence alongside Michelangelo, really seeing what life was like for him. It's a wonderful book, and I really can't recommend it too highly. And actually, very usefully at the end, there's a list of all his works and where you can see them today. So you can see which ones are in Florence, which are in Rome, and where the others are. So that's quite handy. The second novel I've chosen is Galileo's Daughter by Dava Sabel, published in 2000. I made a brief mention of it in the episode on Galileo. If you remember, it's based on 124 letters which were sent to Galileo by his daughter, who was a nun. It lived in a convent near Florence at San Matteo. Her name was Suor, that sister, Suor Maria Celeste. And out of the 124 letters which we have that she wrote to her father, Dava Sabel has woven a novel. A lot of them are quoted. There's narrative in between. And there's quite a lot of material from the trial of Galileo as well, so contemporary notes. So again, a book that really takes you back to that time and that place. Unfortunately, we don't have any of Galileo's replies, but from his daughter's letters, we get a lot of detail about the everyday, her concern for his health, her interest in his work, that sort of thing. And so if all you know about Galileo is his science and his work, you really find out a lot more from this. Towards the end, there's a very moving description of a scene which took place in Santa Croce, in 1737, so 95 years after Galileo's death, when it was decided to put up the new monument to him and to open his grave and move his coffin into the new tomb. At the same time, they took the coffin of Viviani from its tomb because the plan was to bury them both together. And there's a little description here which really takes you right back to that cold, dark evening in Santa Croce. So, quote, Several sculptors and scientists in the party covered the bier with a black cloth and lifting the draped coffin to their shoulders, they bore it through the long passageway from the chapel and across the cavernous basilica. Their chanted prayers for the dead reverberated off the wooden columns which towered over the unattended procession and the stone walls that had been frescoed by Giotto to trace the life of St Francis. Then there's a description of how when they open up Galileo's grave, they're very shocked to find that it contains not one coffin, but two. And when they open them up, it's realised that one of the skeletons belongs to an elderly man, so was Galileo, and the other one was that of a much younger woman, who had died at approximately the same time. And they realised then that that would be Suor Maria Celeste. And here are the last few lines of the book. Quote, the congregation divided itself solemnly in half, each group walking Galileo's body part way through the basilica, so that as many participants as possible could share the honour of being his pallbearers. Then they carried the woman to the mausoleum too, and they laid her in the sepulchre beside her father. Once the shock of the discovery had dissipated into the silence of the great empty church, those attendants who remembered Viviani could unfurl the mystery for themselves. The disciple, 
driven to despair by his failure to pay the tribute he felt he owed his mentor, had given Galileo something dearer than bronze or marble to distinguish his grave. Even now, no inscription on Galileo's much-visited tomb in Santa Croce announces the presence of Suor Maria Celeste, but she is still there. Perhaps the best-known work of English literature, which is set in Florence, would be E. M. Forster's A Rim with a View, about half the novels in Florence, the first half, and it describes the visit of Lucy Honeychurch from England on a bit of a grand tour with her dreary cousin Charlotte, who's supposed to be chaperoning her. And it's quite amusing on the subject of tourists in Florence, a topic which, of course, is very relevant today as well. So in the extract that I've chosen to read, uh, Lucy has gone out for the morning. She's got lost. She's got separated from the person she was with. So she's feeling a bit hopeless and a bit abandoned. She don't think she's used to being out by herself. And she decides to go into a church, Santa Croce, in fact, and have a look round. The annoying thing is she's lost her guidebook. I think her companion's got it. So E.M. Forster's asking the question, really, can she make any sense of this if there isn't a book to tell her what to think? So this is what he writes, quote, Of course, it must be a wonderful building, but how like a barn, and how very cold. Of course, it contained frescoes by Giotto, in the presence of whose tactile values she was capable of feeling what was proper, but who was to tell her which they were? She walked about disdainfully, unwilling to be enthusiastic over monuments of uncertain authorship or date. There was no one even to tell her which of all the sepulchral slabs that paved the nave and transepts was the one that was really beautiful, the one that had been most praised by Mr. Ruskin. Actually, there is some hope for Lucy, because then next thing he writes is, quote, Then the pernicious charm of Italy worked on her, and instead of acquiring information, she began to be happy. If at any point on your visit you get overwhelmed by the wealth of what there is to look at, you might just remember that sentence. There are lots of lovely descriptions, not just of the tourists, but also of some of the expats who've made their home in Florence. One, for example, is a chaplain whom they meet, one Mr. Eager, who invites the ladies out for a drive one day to Fiesole. They can go up the hillside out of the city, admire the views, perhaps have a ramble, and maybe see a view that was admired and used in his pictures by a painter called Alessio Baldovinetti, a man said to have had a real feeling for landscape. So this is how Forster describes what happens next. Quote, Miss Bartlett had not heard of Alessio Baldovinetti, but she knew that Mr. Eager was no commonplace chaplain. He was a member of the residential colony who had made Florence their home. He knew the people who never walked about with Baidikas, who had learned to take a siesta after lunch, who took drives the pension tourists had never heard of, and saw by private influence galleries which were closed to them. Living in delicate seclusion, some in furnished flats, others in Renaissance villas on Fiesoli's slope, they read, wrote, studied and exchanged ideas, thus attaining to that intimate knowledge, or rather perception, of Florence, which is denied to all who carry in their pocket the coupons of Cook. That being Thomas Cook, the travel agents. The people who were just tourists there for a week or two. That's most of us, I think, but his snobbery is quite amusing, is it not? And then lastly, I'd like to recommend a really wonderful novel that I thoroughly enjoyed, namely The Birth of Venus by Sarah Ginant, published in 2003. It's a fictional story, I think I have mentioned it briefly in previous episodes, about a young girl called Alessandra. The inspiration came when Sarah Ginant visited one of the chapels in Santa Maria Novella, and she was looking at the frescoes, and she saw a young girl who really captured her imagination – and around whom she wove the plot of an entire novel. Alessandra, in the novel, is a merchant's daughter. The story is set in 1528, and Alessandra is being married by her family, it's not really her choice, to one Cristoforo, who turns out to be, let's say, not an ideal husband. I don't want to spoil the plot by telling you why not. And so the question then is, what is Alessandra, who's a fiercely independent girl, going to do about this? She's expected, of course, to put up with it, but will she? Before long, she falls in love with the painter that her parents have employed to decorate the fresco in their chapel. And the story takes many twists and turns, and we know quite early on that Alessandra is going to end up as a nun, she's going to be one sister Lucrezia, and the novel really is about how it is that this set of circumstances comes about. When you meet Alessandra early on, it sounds quite unlikely, really, but as life develops, that's what happens. <laughs> 
and there are many references to the Florence of the day. We meet some of the artists, there are street scenes, the French invasion is described, other historical events, the bonfire of the vanities, for example, is described. That's a marvellous read that really takes you right back to medieval Florence. The Daily Telegraph review on the back of the book says describes it as follows, quote, It's a vivid and compellingly believable picture of Renaissance Florence. The squalor, the brutality, the confidence and vitality, the political machinations. Magnificent. There are so many lovely little paragraphs with just detail about life in the time. So, for example, a description of the cloth trade. Alessandro's father works in the cloth trade. And this at a time when Florence was a bridge between east and west, importing cotton and wool from England and dyes from the east and producing the most wonderful cloths. So she describes, for example, quote, rainbow dyes, vermilion from the Red Sea, cochineal from the Mediterranean, cloth dyed and shipped to foreign lands. And there's a wonderful description of a, a wedding. Not Alessandra's wedding, a much bigger, fancier wedding. Perhaps a Medici wedding? And she describes how the palazzo was hung with tapestries for the celebrations, for the wedding banquet, how long trestle tables were set up in the courtyard. And there's a lovely list of some of the foods that were served, which included roasted peacock, turtle dove, deer, capon, chicken, veal, whole roasted kid. She describes the smell of spiced flesh, of oranges, of nutmegs, of saffron and dates tells us how the feasting went on for hours and was followed by dancing. Again, really atmospheric. Definitely a book not to miss. OK, so that's it for today. That rounds up the very last episode on Florence. Sees us at the end of our virtual travels. I hope you've enjoyed the journey. And I hope too that you'll join me for the next series, which is going to start next week when we're going somewhere completely different. But I hope equally interesting and equally lovely, and that's the beautiful South German city of Munich. I think there'll be slightly fewer episodes, perhaps 12 or 14, but I'm going to take a similar approach. So a smattering of history, as many interesting stories as I can find behind the scenes from some of the buildings that you're going to be visiting. Of course, a treatment of that dismal period of history in Munich, the Hitler years. A treatment of some of the most enticing things about modern day Munich, the sausages, the beer, the Oktoberfest, and of course the art. And definitely a chance to get to know some real characters, such as Ludwig II with his fairy tale castles, and Lola Montez, who toured Europe as a really not very good dancer, but managed to get all sorts of important men to be smitten with her, not least Ludwig I. So, all of that to come. I hope you'll join me. And for the meanwhile, thank you very much for your company on the trip to Florence. And I'll sign out one last time by saying grazie and arrivederci. <laughs>